This is going to be a study on some things that non-dispensationalists believe about dispensationalists. Number one, they think that we don't believe that there was grace in the Old Testament. And this is not true because without the grace and mercy of God, everybody that ever existed would have went to hell. And if you read in Genesis 6, 8, it says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In Exodus 34, 7, it says, Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. So, of course, there was mercy in the Old Testament. Of course, there was grace in the Old Testament. But they didn't have eternal salvation. And they didn't have eternal salvation by grace through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ. And if they did, listen to this, if they did, then why weren't their sins cleared? As it just said in Exodus 34, 7, and that will by no means clear the guilty. God forgave their sins, but they didn't have them cleared. And that's clear. Hebrews 10, 4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. None of the sacrifices took away their sin. Even if they kept the law perfectly and broke it in one point, they're guilty of all of it, they would have went to hell. Nobody kept the law perfectly. If they were looking forward to the cross and eternally saved like we are eternally saved today, then why didn't they have their sins cleared? And why didn't they go to the third heaven when they died? Ask yourself these simple questions. But non-dispensationalists think that we don't believe that there was grace in the Old Testament. That's a complete lie. I don't know any dispensationalist, a real Bible-believing dispensationalist that teaches that. Number two, non-dispensationalists think that we worship Israel, that we worship the Jews. That's not true. I don't love Jews more than I love anyone else. I completely realize the Jews are wicked Christ rejectors today, but that there is going to be a remnant of believing Jews who will be believers in the time of Jacob's trouble. They will get the land that God gave to Abraham. And God isn't done with Israel. That's what we believe. The church doesn't replace Israel. And knowing this fact shows us that there are dispensations. It shows us that God deals with the world differently, with men differently throughout the Bible. Because the body of Christ is going to leave out in a rapture before the time of Jacob's trouble, not the church's trouble. And then the Lord goes back to dealing with the Jews. However, today, in the body of Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. This alone shows the Lord is dealing with people differently in that future time period than he is now. Romans eleven twenty five through 28 says this. Now read these verses carefully. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. So now, so now, if, if these verses is referring to the church, then it described the church as blind, not saved yet, without our sins taken away, and enemies to the gospel. So how has the church replaced Israel? So it isn't that dispensationalists have a satanic romance with the Jews. It's that we know that God isn't done with Israel. No true Bible-believing dispensationalist would ever say, and I've never heard a real true Bible-believing dispensationalist say that a Jew goes to heaven just because he's a Jew. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. He has to believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and anyone who says otherwise is teaching something false and saying somebody's getting there by another way. You can't go to heaven and be saved just because you were born a Jew. That's crazy. Now, number three, they think that we can do, they think that we believe that we can do whatever we want because we aren't under the law. And that's another lie I've heard them say. Romans 6.15 says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? 
God forbid. That sums up my answer right there, exactly what Paul said. Just because we are saved by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't mean we should do whatever we want to do. We should strive to live holy. And the fact that non-dispensationalists, and notice I'm not, gonna, I'm not talking about all of them. I'm mostly talking about a certain group of them slander us by saying we believe we can do whatever we want. That shows they're sinking down to the level of those who teach eternal insecurity because those who teach eternal insecurity will attack us because since we believe eternal security, they say that we think we can do whatever we want to because we are once saved, always saved. Just because I'm eternally secure doesn't mean I should go do and do whatever I want. Just because I'm not under the law doesn't mean I should go and do whatever I want. All right, now number four. Non-dispensationalists think that we believe Old Testament saints were eternally saved by works. Not true. No real Bible-believing dispensationalist believes that the Old Testament saints gained eternal salvation and made it to the third heaven by keeping the law or by the blood of bulls and goats. Not even Ruckman who they always bring up, not David Walker. And you can get David Walker's book, uh, Bible Believers Guide to Dispensationalism, and you can see where he says that every, all, all of them have made, it to the, made it to the third heaven by the blood of Jesus Christ. Ruckman says it in his book. But they didn't get the blood applied to them before it had been shed. They couldn't get eternal salvation or make it to the third heaven without the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So what we don't believe is that the Old Testament saints got the blood applied to them before it had even been shed. And if the Lord did apply it to them before it was shed, why didn't they have their sins completely cleared? Why didn't they go to the third heaven? And if they had the blood of Jesus applied to them, then why did they have to shed the blood of an animal? How does that make sense? That's crazy. None of the Old Testament saints ever made it to heaven without the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, and even though I say that, they'll still say I didn't say it. But none of them kept the law perfectly. The law never eternally saved those people. Keeping the law and offering the prescribed sacrifice when they broke it got them to paradise on the heart of the earth. It didn't save them. The people that were in paradise on the heart of the earth, you really couldn't say that they were saved. Like you say, when me and you believe the gospel today were saved, that's not so for them. They were safe. It kept them safe, what they did. They were safe in the heart of the earth where they would wait on the Savior to die for the sins of the whole world. Now, number five, some non-dispensationalists teach that we don't believe that all the Scripture is good. And they will teach against hyper-dispensationalism to teach against Bible-believing dispensationalism, which doesn't work. As I've said before, if you use hyper-dispensationalism, if you teach against that to teach against all dispensationalism, that's like teaching against all Baptists by teaching against the free will Baptists. But they'll say that we only believe Romans through Philemon is doctrine for us today, and that's not true. That's a hyper-dispensationalist teaching. But of course, all the Bible is good. Every book of the Bible can have doctrine for me today. It isn't that Romans through Philemon are the only books with doctrine for me today. It's that they are the primary doctrine for us today. And Hebrews was written by Paul. But that's not part of the church age doctrine, even though you can find doctrine in Hebrews today, just like you can find doctrine in Exodus, Leviticus, in any book of the Bible for us today. Exodus, Leviticus was primary doctrine for those under the law. And Hebrews, James, 1st, 2nd Peter, Jude, and Revelation is primary doctrine for those in the time of Jacob's trouble. It doesn't mean we can't find doctrine for us in any book of the Bible. It's that those aren't primarily for us like the Pauline epistles. And you can't go into the Old Testament and take where they're shedding the blood of an animal and apply that for yourself today. You can't go to the Old Testament and take where they're Sabbath keepers and apply that to yourself today. 
knowing this fact, it doesn't mean you can't find doctrine in over the other books of the Bible. It doesn't mean you can't get instruction in righteousness in other books of the Bible. It doesn't mean that they're not for our learning. And it doesn't mean that any part of the Bible is any less inspired or preserved. So, how do you know what to apply to you today? Familiarize yourself with the Pauline epistles, and if it matches Pauline doctrine, then it's for you today. If not, it's for somebody else, whether in the Old Testament, or it could be for somebody in the Tribulation. And number six, non-dispensationalists think that every dispensationalist believes that the word dispensation means period of time. And that's one of the things that they bring up over and over and over again is about how dispensation doesn't mean period of time. And of course, I don't believe dispensation means period of time. It has to do with God dispensing something. As you see in, he, in, in Ephesians 3, 2, it says, If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. Dispensation here is referring to God dispensing grace to Paul. Notice it says, which is given me to you. Word. So it has to do with God dispensing something. Just because some dispensationalists will call dispensations periods of time doesn't actually mean they believe that's the real definition of the word. It's become like a figure of speech or a saying to use dispensation and period of time period of time interchangeably even though that is isn't exactly what the word means just like a man may say we're in the dispensation of grace now if he thinks this is a really a time period called grace then that's wrong and if he thinks this is the only time when god's grace has been around then that would be wrong but really he's probably just meaning the grace of god is more prevalent today than it was before and he's probably just calling it a dispensation of dispensation of grace as a figure of speech, just something somebody started saying and it sounded good, so they just all started saying it. But there has been grace and mercy all throughout the Bible, and we aren't in a period of time called grace. So you can't use that against dispensationalism like you've been doing. Colossians one twenty five says, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. If dispensation means period of time, then there would be a dispensation called God, because it says the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you. Notice again, it's, it's, God, it's Paul getting something from God. God's dispensing something. And number seven, non-dispensationalists think that we don't know about the pictures and types of Jesus Christ on every page of the Old Testament. Of course, I know that Adam is a type of Christ. I know the ark shows us Jesus Christ. I know that Joseph showed us Christ in over 150 ways. I know that Jesus Christ is shown all throughout the Old Testament. John 5.39 says, Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Jesus said that, and the only Scriptures written at the time that Jesus said this was the Old Testament. So, of course, the Old Testament shows us Jesus Christ. Acts 10.43 says, To him give all the prophets witness, that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. John 5.46 for had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. So there is no doubt about it. No doubt in this world. The Old Testament writers, the prophets, wrote about Jesus Christ. The thing is, they didn't know who Jesus Christ was. They didn't know the gospel we know today because they didn't have it revealed to them yet. And this is so clear because after Jesus' resurrection, he had to open the scriptures and show the disciples the scriptures concerning himself in Luke twenty four twenty seven it says in beginning at Moses and all the prophets he expounded unto them and all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So we have a huge advantage today in that we have the entire Bible, we have all four gospels, we have Jesus Christ living in us, we have the entire New Testament. I know about Jesus Christ, so I have the advantage of looking at the Old Testament 
through the lens of the New Testament. So the Old Testament saints did not have this luxury. While they wrote down about Jesus Christ, they didn't know what they were writing. They didn't have a full knowledge of what they were saying. They didn't know the name of Jesus Christ. They didn't know the gospel. Now, number eight, non-dispensationalists teach that I would believe the Old Testament saints were saved by another gospel. Not so, because as I said before, they weren't saved. At best, they were safe. In the sense, they had their sins cleared and a home in heaven, they weren't saved. You can't say that, because they couldn't get their sins cleared through the shed blood of an animal. And they weren't going to the third heaven when they died. They were safe when they did what God told them to do. They all would eventually have to believe the gospel and get to heaven by the blood of Jesus Christ. However, the gospel had to actually take place first. But these guys weren't born again. They weren't spiritually circumcised. They weren't redeemed. And you hear all these guys saying they were born again in the Old Testament. If they were born again, why didn't they go to heaven? Why didn't they have their sins cleared? Being born again is a New Testament thing. Now you have a lot of non-dispensationalists today who are saying the Old Testament saints went to the third heaven when they died. While they also recently came out and said that the Old Testament saints didn't know the name of Jesus and they didn't know the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, and that's exactly right. But now if they didn't even know the gospel and didn't know the details of the gospel, how were they saved by the same gospel? I'm saved because I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as my crucified, buried, and risen Savior. But if I didn't know that Jesus Christ was my crucified, and buried, and risen Savior, how could I be saved by a gospel that I didn't even know? How does that make sense? So in reality, it isn't us that's teaching they were saved by another gospel. It's actually that certain sect of non-dispensationalists teaching they were saved by another gospel because they're putting the Old Testament saints in heaven before the blood of Jesus Christ had been shed and before any of the Old Testament saints had an understanding of the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4. They're applying the blood to them before the blood had been shed and before they even knew the gospel. So how is that not getting to heaven some other way? They're the ones that's teaching they got there by another gospel, not me. Now number nine, non-dispensationalists think that we've never read Romans 4. I mean, I've been reading Romans 4 since I got saved. I've not been saved long. But I've read Romans 4 over and over and over again. I mean, who hasn't read Romans 4 over and over again? But in Romans 4, it tells us how Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Of course we've read Romans 4. But seeing as how the disciples didn't even know the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection... Abraham certainly didn't know the gospel of the death, burial, and resurrection. And if you read Genesis 15, 5 through 6, where it speaks of what Abraham believed, you will see that Abraham believed God about his seed, not about the death, burial, and resurrection. Let's look at what Abraham believed in Genesis 15, 5 through 6. It says, And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord. And he counted it to him for righteousness. So what did he believe? He believed God about what he said. Look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. That's what Abraham believed. I'm not denying Abraham had faith. I'm not denying he had grace. I'm not denying he had mercy. It's like, it's like they think that I'm denying that Abraham had all this stuff. I'm not. I'm denying that he was looking forward to the cross. And if you read the rest of Romans 4, it even tells you what Abraham believed. He believed God when he said he would have children. And that is how he got righteousness, was by believing this. Now, not even this was good enough to get Abraham eternal salvation. Abraham didn't go to heaven and get a blood, the blood of Jesus Christ applied to him because he believed God about his seed. But this made it made him able to go to paradise in the heart of the earth where he would wait for Jesus Christ to die and shed his blood and get him out. See, all these guys have gotten so upset because they think, we believe, Old Testament saints gained eternal salvation and access to the third heaven by works or by some other gospel. 
but it's not true. Now, number 10, non-dispensationalists think that we learned everything we know about dispensationalism from a man named John Nelson Darby. And I, to this day, have never read anything by Darby. I don't even think I'd know who he was if they hadn't talked about him so much. That's who I hear about him the most from is non-dispensationalists who say that we got all of our teachings from him. I don't know him. I've still not, not read anything by him. And the only thing I know about him is what the non-dispensationalists have told me about him. And it may not even be true because half the stuff they say about all the other dispensationalists aren't true. But I'll say this. I learned dispensationalism from great men. Just like you learned eternal security from great men. Just because you learned that you wear a tie to church from other men. You learned that you go to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night by other men. And all these things that you do. You learned all your tradition. You learned all your doctrine. Most likely from another person. But just because you learned something from someone else doesn't mean it's wrong. That's not too hard to understand. A good portion of what you know you learned from somebody else. I mean, God gave us pastors and teachers and evangelists for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. If He, he, he appointed people to teach, and if you can't learn from the pe people that God appointed you, then what was the point of Him giving them to us? So just because you learn something from somebody else doesn't mean it's wrong. But what you do is you learn from something from somebody else. You get the Bible and make sure that what they're telling you is right. And the Bible teaches dispensationalism. and even says the word dispensation. And the non-dispensationalists will say, if you had a Bible and you never had a commentary or a preacher, you would never see dispensationalism in the Bible. But how is that true when it says the word dispensation? And like I said, it doesn't mean a period of time, but dispensation is in the Bible. And Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. So sundry times and in diverse manners. The Lord changes not, but the way he dealt with people obviously does change. And there are clear divisions throughout the Bible. And that is why 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly divide means to divide. Now, I heard this non-dispensationalist the other day teach it means to handle properly or something like that. And he's just taken the reading from the modern version of the Bible, which says to handle correctly or handle, handle properly. But it doesn't say that. It says rightly divide. That means divide. There are clear divisions in Scripture. And if all you had was Scripture and no commentary or preacher you would still find divisions just from reading it. Let's look at it. John 1.17 says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Right there, that shows us that there was a time before the law and a time during the law. Before the law was given by Moses, there was a time before the law. I mean, Moses wrote Genesis, but he wasn't at the beginning of Genesis, and he couldn't have given the law at the beginning of Genesis. So that shows that there was a time before the law was given by Moses. Now look at Luke sixteen sixteen. It says, The law and the prophets were until John. So there you have a time before the law, during the law, and then the law and the prophets were until John. So you... Then you have the Old Testament ending with the death of the testator, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, because it says in Hebrews 9.16, For where a testament is, there must also of a necessity be the death of the testator. So right off, you have at least four dividing points. Before the law, under the law, a time that's still Old Testament, but the law, the law and the prophets ended with John, so you have a, a time during Jesus Christ's earthly ministry and then the New Testament. Let's look at it again. You have a time before the law. Moses gave the law, so you have a time during the law. The law and the prophets were until John. So there's a time that's a, a different time during Jesus Christ's earthly ministry. And then you have the New Testament after the death of the testator where Jesus Christ died on the cross. And then you have another one. 
Ephesians 1.10 says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So the dispensation of the fullness of times, that's the dispensation when everything's wound up, you have the new heavens, the new earth, all of God's people are together. So there's more divisions in the Bible than just the Old and New Testament. Now, if you want to keep believing that the Old Testament saints were saved by grace through faith and looking forward to the cross, and all of them went to the third heaven when they died, then go right ahead. I mean, I don't think that that's a make-or-break doctrine there. I don't think that you're going to hell for teaching that. I honestly don't care what you teach about that. But what is, what's vexing is the continuous slander that comes out of the mouth of non-dispensationalists who are so intimidated by the Bible-believing crowd that they have to tell lies and dig up dirt on the personal lives of dispensationalists because they have no scripture for what they teach. And if you watch that Dispensation of Heresy movie, pretty much all the movie was just slinging mud at the personal lives of dispensationalists, even talking about the sins that their kids have committed after they died. But other than the stuff I've already disproved in this study, they really don't have any scripture for what they teach. Now, I myself believe a lot of these guys are Bible students, and I'm, that's saying a lot more than most dispensationalists would say about them. Because I, I watch their videos, I see what they come out with, they go... They do verse-by-verse verse studies. I can tell they're reading the Bible and studying the Bible. and uh, So they're Bible students, but they're way off on the subject of dispensationalism. And I also say that I believe they are saved and love God. Now I, now, I doubt they would say the same for me. And I've heard them say themselves that I wasn't saved and that anyone who believes in certain forms of dispensations aren't saved, which that in itself is adding to the gospel. When you say that someone isn't saved just because he's teaching something you, you don't believe, that's adding to the gospel. You're saying he has to believe the gospel and believe that certain thing that you say. But a, but a heresy, teaching a heresy is a work of the flesh. And if dispensationalism is heresy, it doesn't mean I'm not saved. It means I'm yielding myself to the flesh. But this has been some things that non-dispensationalists teach about dispensationalists.